This is the Physical Activity Researcher Podcast, a podcast for researchers of sedentary behavior, physical activity, and sports. Join for a relaxed dialogue about research design, practicalities, and, well, anything related to research. Learn from your fellow researchers useful and relevant information that does not fit into formal content and limited space of scientific publications. And here is your host, researcher and entrepreneur, Ali Tikkanen. Welcome, everyone. I'm here at the Oslo Metropolitan University, and I'm very excited about the guest of today's episode. He's professor at Oslo Met and the head of the research group Clinical Interventions and Biomedical Engineering. He has three main research areas, hemodynamic and cardiovascular responses to resistance exercise, neuroimaging of brain activity during physical activity, and energy expenditure of prosthetic ampullation. Ladies and gentlemen, here is our guest, Terje Siovak. Welcome, Terje. Thank you, Ole. Yes, so so you have done research in a quite wide range uh, of themes. Which one of the fields you feel most passionate about? Oh, uh, tricky question. <laughs> uh i feel passionate about uh, all three uh, yeah <clears throat> nowadays i focus more on uh, energy expenditure and uh, monitoring brain activity during physical activity but historically i've done a lot of studies on hem- hemodynamics uh, during uh, resistance exercise mm. and uh, i think that is because i have an PhD in exercise physiology, so it was natural for me to move into that field. Uh, <clears throat> and I studied the hemodynamics um, uh, in cardiac patients, uh, especially because they uh, often are, are, as a group, they are individuals with uh, low physical strength, but they need to increase the strength to, to mm. do their. Uh, daily activities and, yeah. and uh, there are good ways of doing resistance exercise and there are bad ways and we, we did know very little about how blood pressure and things responded to different kinds of resistance training so that that was the uh, one of the cornerstones of my research but uh, lately with the onset of more variable devices. We have moved a little bit more into the field of of uh, monitoring energy expenditure and uh, and then uh, uh, monitoring brain activity. Mm, yeah, yeah. And in the hemodynamics, what what are the most important things with the, with the cardiac patients? Well, the, the thing is that uh, there are international guidelines for how cardiac patients should exercise mm. while doing uh, uh, resistance exercise. And, and, and mainly the advice was that people should lift uh, weights uh, with uh, moderate resistance and doing many repetitions. Mm. For example, 40 to 60 percent of their maximum capacity mm. and lifting 13, 14, 15 repetitions. Mm. Uh, When we started our investigation, we saw that if people follow uh, these recommendations, they in fact have a higher blood pressure than if they lift much heavier weights, but Mm. with fewer repetitions. Uh, So our research uh, showed that uh, uh, the blood pressure increases by the number of repetitions and is less related to, to to the actual weight that you are lifting. All right. That's actually quite counterintuitive because if, yeah. if you put a lot of weight, you kind of even feel feel the pressure, I think. Yeah, uh, you can do that. Uh, but the trick is to avoid what we call the Valsalva mm. maneuver, which is uh, holding your breath during lifting. Yeah. So if you breathe with an open mouth uh, during both uh, uh, the lifting phase and the lowering phase uh, of, of the exercise, yeah, your blood pressure will not increase 
uh, as much as if you uh, hold your breath. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, <clears throat> so that is one way of controlling the blood pressure, mm -hmm. and also that if you do, even if you do heavy lifting, uh, but for example, four, five, six reps, your blood mm -hmm. pressure will not have the time to increase uh, ah. to 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 the levels we see if you lift, for example, fifteen repetitions. Okay, that's actually quite interesting. And when you do the Valsalva maneuver, is it that it supports your uh, torso to keep the position? Does it cause any problems if you keep breathing? That can you actually support your uh, body? Yeah, I think you can. Maybe not. Uh, for all exercises, uh, for example, if you do uh, different uh, resistance exercises, sitting in a chair, for example, like knee extension, leg mm. press, uh, shoulder press, bicep curls, things like that, there is no problem with uh, because you get the support from the apparatus. Mm. But you, if you do more <coughs> free exercises like uh, uh, squats and uh, things like that, you, you will feel the need to stabilize a little bit. Mm. Uh, but uh, then you're p perhaps moving into another type of people than we have investigated. Uh, mm. Not many cardiac patients do <laughs> heavy squats. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I can see that. Yeah. And if you lift really, really heavy, for example, testing uh, your maximum strength and so on, there will always be some Valsalva maneuver, even if you try to avoid it. So, yeah. Mm. But but you know, the, the, the cardiovascular system is built to, to withstand the very high blood pressures. So for a normal, healthy... Being, there is no problem with with a higher blood pressure mm. that you uh, encounter during these kind of exercises. Yeah, so basically you would recommend doing the movements while sitting, that you don't need to support your body as much. Yeah, at least for uh, for patients and for people that are a little bit un unaccustomed to resistance training, it's always wise to have some uh, machine training before you move into free uh, free weights, perhaps. Mm, yeah, yeah, and then you can more easily concentrate, keep breathing when when. Yes, you know, it's... there are fewer distractions. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I can see that. And is there an effect of working overhead? Is it different for your blood pressure that if you keep your arms over your head? Yeah. Uh, I haven't done a lot of research on that, uh, but uh, I would guess uh, any kind of overhead work will increase your blood pressure. Mm, uh, yeah. So, but interesting research question, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And what what is kind of the safe limit with the cardiac patients? How high can the blood pressure go? Is there some guideline rule of thumb that it should go over something? Well. <clears throat> It may relate to what kind of cardiac disease you have. Mm. Uh, if you have, uh, what I have investigated is the response in people with, for example, uh, uh, a bypass uh, operation uh, and things like that. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> they can easily tolerate uh, blood pressures that uh, healthy people uh, mm. encounter. But it may be different for people with other cardiac diseases, with uh, heart failure, that uh, that is the, uh, the heart has less capacity to pump blood. Mm. And, and uh, these group of patients are not that well investigated as other uh, uh, groups of cardiac patients. Mm. So I think it's safe to say that... Um, you have to consult your uh, physician before doing this. Uh, uh, and uh, but for people with uh, uh, with uh, which are treated and uh, back to a normal life uh, and uh, on medications and have had their bypass operation and everything is working smooth, uh, there is no uh, real worry 
for them not to participate in, uh, in resistance training. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I think I remember reading something that for cardiac patients it might be more effective to improve their endurance in the beginning by doing strength training than actually endurance training. Have you have you read anything related to this? Yeah, <clears throat> vaguely. I think I remember him reading it, but I don't remember the yeah <laughs> the actual study. Yeah, I I don't remember. Also, it might be the difference between the local and systemic endurance that yeah. maybe after mm-hmm. the after the surgery you are kind of the, you need the local endurance more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, are are you still doing some studies with this hemodynamics, or is this <clears throat> from the past mainly? No, I'm writing up a publication now, uh, or yeah, or in fact two, uh, one on a study on uh, <clears throat> on the post exercise uh, response uh, uh, to to exercise on, on blood pressure, mm. uh, and the other study is uh, a continuation of, of the of our previous work on uh, hemodynamics during resistance training. Yeah. Uh, where I looked at <clears throat> what is the blood pressure when you lift a weight, uh, a heavy weight uh, uh, with with the Valsalva maneuver, and then what is the blood pressure if you do it without the Valsalva maneuver? Mm. And yeah. I've done this uh, in a group of patients doing lifting heavy weights, and also the same with lifting more moderate weights. Yeah. So, so I can compare the different. Uh, Resistance levels uh, <coughs> with and without the double salvo maneuvers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So, if we go to your other field of research, uh, the energy en- expenditure of prosthetic ampullation, uh, why is it important to study the energy expenditure in these people? Well, first of all, they have uh, lost a leg. Uh, <clears throat> and they have uh, difficulty moving around, mm. and basically they need to learn to walk again. Mm. Uh, they have to learn to use uh, uh, prosthesis that don't give them any uh, kinesthetic feedback from the ground. Mm. So, so everything is very different, and uh, <clears throat> there is a great interest in the community about. Well, everybody say that uh, people with uh, lower limb amputation, they have a higher energy expenditure. Uh, and coming from the, my background of exercise physiology, I was very intrigued by this and mm. wondering why is it so that uh, uh, their energy expenditure is higher or is it higher? Mm. Uh, that was the first target of investigations. Uh, and behind all this is the fact that all these people with the lower limb amputation say that the ability to move around and uh, <coughs> do some physical activity and be in the nature is very important for their uh, mental health. Mm. So, so, so then it's important to find out what are the obstacles in daily life for for these people that uh, stop them from being physically uh, physically active? Is it the prosthesis? Is it that uh, they are in low uh, physical conditions? Or is it some other factor mm. that, uh, that could explain uh, the, their energy expenditure? Yeah, yeah. And so you said that people think that it's higher have you have you measured and have you noticed that it's actually higher or is it uh, depending on the individual or how, how does it go well <laughs> this is a little bit tricky question because it depends your angle of uh, <laughs> how you have yeah but typically in the clinical literature you see that uh, everybody almost reported that uh, energy expenditure in uh, lower limb amputees is higher mm. than people with uh, uh, two intact legs. Yeah. Uh, but then they look at a figure which is called walking economy. Mm. And walking economy is having the oxygen uptake 
and divide it on the walking speed. Mm. So then you get the oxygen uptake per meter traveled. Mm. But when you break down the numbers, you can see that the actual, uh, if a lower limb amputee and a healthy person walk at their self-selected speed, yeah, uh, the people, the speed yeah. that they uh, normally choose without uh, having to hurry or do anything specific. You see that the, their oxygen uptake is uh, similar. Mm. Let's say it's fifteen milliliters per kilo per, mm. per, per minute. Yeah, but what you also observe is that their self-selected speed is very different. Yeah, a lower empathy could have, for example. Walking speed of one meter per second. Yeah. Uh, and a healthy person could have, for example, 1.4 meters per second. And if you have then the same oxygen attack and divide it on different speeds, mm. <clears throat> this will affect the walking economy. So the walking economy used in this context is wrong, I think, mm. because it does not tell you how much. Uh, uh, energy the body expense it tells you how much uh, it tells you about an energy expenditure that is much, very much related to the walking speed mm. so you need to find another variable that is more independent of walking speed to, to give a true estimate of what is the energy expenditure during uh, prosthetic ambulation mm. and I think what we need to do is to test there maximum aerobic capacity yeah and then relate the energy expenditure during walking to a percentage of their maximum capacity mm. then you can also compare different groups and uh, different persons because you have uh, uh, the relative intensity yeah so, yeah so that has been the focus for g4 papers uh, to to dig into this and uh, try to look at energy expenditure from a new angle for, for, for this group of patients. Okay, let's get back to that in a moment and hear a few words from our sponsors. This podcast is sponsored by Fibian, a research device that has been shown to be valid in tracking sitting, standing, physical activity and energy expenditure. Furthermore, Fibian has been shown to be valid categorizing physical activity into light, moderate, and vigorous intensity. Get scientific validation and learn more about Fibian at fibian.com slash research. And, and how, how does it affect that you don't have the proprioception, and you don't have the feedback uh, coming? coming? So how, how does it mm. affect the walking? Uh, yeah, that's... Uh, observation uh, <coughs> well we did some observations when we did these energy expenditure studies and uh, we saw that people with lower limb amputation they need to orientate themselves in the room much more than people with two intact legs mm. meaning that they use their sight a lot more, they have to scan the room or the, the surroundings for if, if there are obstacles so they can prepare better for what is um, coming towards them mm. uh, and uh, this then started uh, in fact the research field with uh, neuroimaging yeah <laughs> because me and my colleagues we noticed that uh, when People with lower limb, uh, lower limb amputation uh, just did ordinary walking, and mm. we had them to look away from uh, from uh, from the floor. Yeah. And then the uh, the balance got worse. Yeah. So it made us think that uh, uh, eyesight was very important for maintaining balance. Yeah. Because they they, they cannot uh, feel the kinesthetic feedback from from the ground. Yeah, and orientate through that. Yeah. So then I was thinking, how could we possibly investigate what is going on in the brain? Yeah. Uh, in free moving uh, people. Yeah. And uh, this then uh, 
has started this um, research uh, interest we have with looking at uh, uh, brain activity during mm. uh, prosthetic ambulation. Yeah. And so, so basically, they don't get any proprioceptive feedback. And do you think they might walk with the stiffer legs? Like I think older people, because the reaction times are, are longer, they usually start to co-activate their muscles that they don't need to respond, that they go a little bit stiffer. Do you, do you know if this happens also with the amputees? I'm not sure. I haven't done any EMG studies on, on these people, but uh, they walk. Uh, they walk a little bit different mm. uh, than uh, healthy people, uh, and uh, their stance face on on a healthy leg and an amputated leg is different. Yeah, uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, and of course. Uh, the ability for them to correct their uh, walking while <laughs> doing the activity is is uh, much less uh, uh, well. There have much less possibility to, to correct the walking, so so it's it's uh, harder to to do ordinary walking. So so many amputees they don't walk for walk for longer distances at, at the same time. Mm. But they do a lot of uh, intermediate activities, and then they have to rest, and then they do their activity again. And yeah. Yeah. So you could think that maybe the when you start to measure their daily life, maybe their bouts of walking differ from the healthy ones. Yes, uh, we <laughs> think so, and we are starting a study now to look into this. Uh, what are the length of the activity bouts for these these persons? Uh, how long are the how many steps do they take in each activity bout? Mm. Uh, how long are the resting periods? Uh, how long do they sit? How long do they stand? Things like this is important to know because, uh, as we all are told, physical activity is good for you. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and. And about the the resting periods, do you need they need more resting periods? And if so, why is why is that? Where does the need for rest rest come from? I think it could be related to several things. <laughs> One thing is that uh, uh, walking with a prosthesis can give you some uh, skin trouble, mm. uh, aberrations in the skin, uh, and your amputated stump get a little bit sore mm. uh, <clears throat> so for that reason alone you, you need to to take off the prosthesis for example and, and rest a little bit yeah uh, <clears throat> and of course uh, uh, the fitting of the prosthesis uh, to 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 the actual remaining leg is also very important and if that fitting is not good it could affect the uh, uh, about how you walk and how stressful it is to walk and uh, not everybody get uh, the best fit that is possible uh, yeah so yeah, there are maybe several reasons because they uh, uh, or, or why they need to rest a lot but but also <clears throat> I think uh, looking at some of the previous studies we have done we see that uh, Maximum aerobic capacity of this group of uh, person is very low. Mm. So maybe in the range of 25 to 30 milliliters, milliliters per kilo per minute. Yeah. And this means that doing activities of daily life will tax your maximum capacity much more than a person with a higher VO2 max. Mm. So if you constantly are... <clears throat> Uh, are uh, doing activities that are close to <laughs> your maximum capacity yeah. you of course get more tired yeah yeah naturally so so basically you said that probably the bouts of walking are different and this is usually because of the fitting and the soreness in the in the stomp so do you think you could see actually something valuable of how well it fits if you actually measure their daily life and their 
the longest activity pouts or something you start to look the activity more closely do you think it would tell something about the success of the fit or, or so on yeah i believe so uh, and uh, I, i'm not a prosthetic en uh, engineer uh, <clears throat> but i know there is a lot of uh, adjustments to be, to be made uh, uh, for fitting the prosthesis mm. uh, properly and what we call the alignment for example uh, how the the lower leg orientates to to to, to the knee joint uh, mm. uh, which is um, uh, of uh, an um, electronic or hydraulic uh, knee joint is also a major player into this game mm. so you could easily uh, think that for example if if your prosthesis is not properly aligned yeah uh, the effort of walking will feel very much higher and then of course you will will not feel uh, the urgency to 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 walk as much as uh, as before yeah yeah i can see that and what what do you think are the the factors mainly preventing physical activity with this group of people like well one thing is that several activities become much more troublesome to do for example cycling mm -hmm. uh, you, you can have your specific cycling prosthesis yeah uh, uh, but if you don't Uh, you have uh, maybe have a problem with uh, when you pull your leg upwards on on the pedal mm. that uh, uh, fitting may be a little bit uh, loosened uh, by the re yeah. repetitive work uh, and there is the problem with the uh, sweating for example inside the stump uh, yeah. and things like that and uh, Swimming gets more difficult because you know only have one leg for propulsion. Mm. Uh, so, so there are some things that people maybe have enjoyed to do, but it becomes much more difficult. So, but but of course there are other activities that could replace these kinds of activities. Mm. And for example, doing uh, exercise in a rowing machine. Yeah, uh, would be uh, beneficial, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, then you can sit down and uh, do most of the work uh, with your upper body, and uh, but also get some leg work. Yeah, and and how how do you see the importance of of daily physical activity measurements to to measure the progress of rehabilitation? I think. Uh, It's very important that this patient group get uh, feedback, mm. uh, <clears throat> a personalized uh, feedback on uh, how they are doing. Because many of them are, well, many of the elderly uh, lower limb amputees uh, are amputated because they have some vascular disease, mm. uh, and diabetes, and things like that, and. For prevention of further disease and also for improving the, the quality of life, uh, <clears throat> it's important that they are, have some level of physical activity. Mm. Uh, but uh, you know, every, everybody needs some kind of motivation, and some people are very self-motivated, but other people need some input to, to, for example, do their exercises and and do them properly. Mm. So I think. Uh, a system that could give some more or less instant feedback to to a patient group that tells them uh, about if they reached their activity goal or not would be uh, very beneficial. And I think uh, with today's technology, we are closing in on that target because devices are getting smaller and better and more accurate. Mm. And, uh, Software is also getting better in analyzing this this data. Yeah, yeah, and and do you think there's more importance for avoidance of sedentary behavior or promotion of light physical activity or moderate to vigorous intensity activity in these groups? Uh, I recently 
just observed that there is a new study out from Norwegian School of Sports Science, uh, and one of the uh, writers there, uh, <coughs> argumenting that uh, uh, moderate and, and uh, uh, fairly fair, fair light physical yeah. activity was very important for for uh, for uh, for health. Uh, and I think for this specific uh, patient group, it's important that uh, they increase uh, or decrease their amount of sitting. Mm. Because uh, it's not good to sit uh, too much. Mm. Uh, and uh, especially if you want to retrain your capacity for walking, you, you need, in fact, to use uh, your leg uh, and your prosthesis in a regular fashion. Mm. So so we need to decrease the amount of sitting for this group of patients. Yeah, and basically replace it with walking. Yes, I think so <laughs> as a start. And... Uh, uh, but uh, walking is, is uh, a fundamental uh, activity for human beings, and it makes them independent. And if they then can move into also more vigorous types of activity, it would it would be good. But the main target must be to get them uh, get more walking. Mm. Out of this group. Yeah, and I think it, you made a good point that elderly people they have some vascular disease, diabetes. Yeah because they get the amputation and they are already having high risks for, for these diseases to progress. Yes, or, or, sure. yeah. yeah, so it's even more important, the activity for them. And and I heard you said something earlier when we discussed that you had some special tests for amputees, that you did the number eight and, and walking with the tray. Could you tell us a little bit more about those? <coughs> yes, this... Uh... These are some tests we have used to investigate the brain responses of uh, for this patient group. Yeah. Uh, we have then a dev device which we call a, a functional near infrared spectroscopy, mm. uh, which looks like uh, a, a cap which you place on the head, and on this cap we have some. Uh, optical uh, sensors yeah and these optical sensors uh, a lot of optodes if you call them they send out near infrared light mm -hmm. uh, and uh, near infrared light has the capacity to to penetrate biological uh, tissue without doing any uh, damage or harm yeah so this light travels into the brain and uh, where it meets hemoglobin and mm. depending on if hemoglobin is oxygenated or not oxygenated, uh, the hemoglobin absorb this uh, near infrared light differently. So, so based on this and some clever calculations, we can look at uh, how much um, activity there are in specific brain regions. Yeah. And... Uh, with that background, we had some tests that challenged the, the walking capacity of the lower limb amputees. They had to walk in a, first in a figure of eight. Yeah. Uh, and the, uh, this may sound trivial, but uh, <clears throat> in fact, for an amputee, it's it's difficult because you have to shift your balance from from your healthy side to to the amputated side, and you. Uh, in one turn, you have the uh, prosthesis on the inside of, of the swing, and uh, on another turn, you have it on the outside. Mm. So, so there's a lot of challenge on doing this, this figure away. And then the second level of this test uh, was that I still walked in a figure away pattern, but in addition, they carried a tray with two glasses of water. Yeah. And uh, when you have a carry a tray, you will no longer see your moving legs. Yeah. Uh, so that adds difficulty. So so the hypothesis was that this would uh, cause increased uh, attentional demand mm. on doing this walking task. 
And the third and the most challenging uh, situation was that we placed uh, <coughs> a lot of uh, foam mats on the floor with uh, which had some uneven uh, structure to it. So the people had to walk in a figure of eight on these uh, foam mats, which mm. were soft and forgiving. And uh, uh, kick pain balance is even more difficult than in the previous conditions. So then we monitored the brain activity during these three uh, challenging conditions yeah. uh, in a group of low limb amputees and compared it to, to, to healthy persons. Yeah. yeah. And we see that the, then the, the attentional demand, the, the amount of uh, activity in the, especially in the free from front frontal cortex yeah. is much higher in, in the lower limb entities than in the healthy controls. Yeah. So basically they have the tray and there was two classes of water. Yeah. So that also increases that you need to balance the tray, not only yourself, right? Yes, correct. So so that, that increases the demands for the brain, but you compare it with the healthy and it was yeah. even even higher than yeah. yeah. So so with, with the tray you have more like a dual task situation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And how do you see this? I was actually uh, interviewing Timo Randalainen earlier in the podcast and he was saying this dual task that it's it's quite an effective way of detecting Parkinson's disease in the early mm. early states or Alzheimer's. I I might make a mistake here. But that you it's too much uh, for your brain to be calculating, for example, backwards and walking well. So do you see any this kind of effects with your, your patient groups? Have you noticed? Yes, so we, we see that uh, they have increased uh, frontal brain activity, uh, meaning that they need to concentrate more mm. in, in doing these tasks. And uh, this may add to the feeling of fatigue when these people walk because there is a lot of brain activity uh, uh, during walking, which mm. uh, and walking is an activity that people uh, regard as uh, easy. Mm. Uh, but uh, for this group of person, it may be much harder because uh, uh, there's a lot more to watch out for. They, yeah, they're the yeah. balance. Their their stance, their uh, are there obstacles there? Are there uh, dual task situations? For example, is the phone ring? Do I need to pick it up from my, from my pocket? Uh, mm. And you, you can see that for yourself if you walk on the street and your mobile phone phone calls and you pick it up and start to talk, you automatically be, begin to walk slower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so there is a lot of uh, things for the brain to, <laughs> to 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 process when we have this yeah. dual task. Yeah. So for them, it needs more conscious thought to be walking, and it might be mentally fatiguing in yes, in the end. Yes, that also. Yeah, and if if we go to this neuroimaging you are using, how how easy is it? it it is to use with the cap, and uh, I, I haven't tried this <laughs> this technology myself. Well, the technology has made great advances during only the last five, six, seven years. <clears throat> so now uh, the system is uh, portable, of course. It's mm. wi wireless. It's battery driven. So, in, in uh, fact, you have a cap on your head yeah. uh, with these optodes. And you have a, a, a belt with a box, and you connect these optodes to to this box, uh, which records all the signals. Yeah. Uh, and then you can uh, walk around and do your thing. Uh, yeah. And uh, study the uh, brain activity during any kind of physical activity. Oh, well, almost any kind. Yeah, yeah. And so you said that there's a belt box. Are there cables going from, from there? Oh. Yes, there is a, uh, some cables going from the optodes to, to this box. Uh, but otherwise, uh, there's a wireless transmission of the data to a receiving computer, for example. So you can get uh, online uh, or real-time uh, data uh you could look at real time data while they do their activity mm, very very 
advanced technology. And, yeah. and you said that you can you can see the activation in the prefrontal cortex and and so on. So how is the resolution? How small area of brain you can measure? Well, there are always trade-offs with different kinds of technology. So for spatial resolution, uh, it's about two three centimeters. Mm. So you cannot have the same spatial resolution as an MRI machine, for example. Yeah, of course. But the temporal resolution is much, much better than an MRI. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, you cannot carry an MRI. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Usually <laughs> not. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the basic principle of operation of the uh, functional near infrared spectroscopy and uh, MRI are the same. Yeah, it's based on something we call the bold principle. So, uh, so while an MRI has a much uh, higher uh, spatial resolution, uh, the FNIRS is much uh, lower, of course. But for studying free moving subjects, uh, there are really only two alternatives. If you want to look at brain activity, mm. it's the FNIRS and then there's EEG. Yeah. But EEG has very high uh, temporal resolution, but very, very low spatial resolution. Yeah. Uh, so, in a kind of EEG and uh, FNIRS, they <coughs> complement each other. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we haven't done any studies on that. But so, just for the moment, we focus on FNIRS then. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. So let's hear a few words from our sponsors and get back to that right after. This podcast is sponsored by Fibian, a research device that has been shown to be valid in tracking sitting, standing, physical activity and energy expenditure. Get scientific validation and learn more about Fibian at fibian.com slash research. So that's a, that's a practical. What kind of applications you would see in your field and in other fields? Like where where would you see this giving the greatest I advantage? Think, yeah, I think within neuro rehabilitation, for example, for any kind of neurodegenerative disease, this would be a very good instrument to to use, both in uh, multiple sclerosis, in Parkinson, in Alzheimer. Uh, and in stroke patients, mm. where you then could monitor rehabilitation process processes uh, more or less continuously, yeah. uh, and and look, for example, if uh, how well is there any neural plasticity going on? Uh, how is the relearning process uh, going on? Are activity in different Areas of the brain or the shifting relating to to the uh, severity of the disease or uh, or the <coughs> or the progress of rehabilitation. These are, I think, important questions we could start uh, answering using this technique. Yeah, and are the researchers looking this or? Yeah, yeah, you know, the number of publications on FNIRS is increasing exponentially. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so there is a lot of research on, on all these areas. But I think uh, s still there are very few people focusing on the group of lower limb amputees. Mm -hmm. so, so there are only a few groups worldwide that use this instrument for, for this group. Yeah. So basically, if somebody is writing a funding applications, there was just good oh, yeah. to see how to use <laughs> FNIRS with different yeah, pace and groups. So yeah, yeah. maybe you want to yeah. see from there. And and how is the how is the price of the device like the, uh, ballpark figure? How how much does it cost? Well, uh, you can go from anywhere from uh, one hundred thousand regions to many millions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Depending on uh, the number of channels uh, you you get, yeah, if you get a three-channel device uh, that can then look at only one specific area in the brain. 
Yeah. And for example, on one side of the head, you may spend 100,000 francs. Yeah. But if you want high density recordings <coughs> or, uh, from the whole head, yeah, uh, you talk many, many, many millions. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And we're talking about crowns, so it's about dividing with 10 yes, to get yes. euros, dollars, yeah. pounds, yeah. about. And and with the channels, how many channels you are having? Well, uh, we have uh, different options. We have uh, one system that gives uh, around 50 channels. Yeah. Or we could have uh, 20 channels, dif- depending on the, the setup. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so that covers most of our work, uh, mostly. Yeah. Uh, so because we are interested in more or less in what's going on the motor cortex, the prefrontal cortex, and the pre-motor area, mm. uh, so forth. So so that uh, with the forty fifty thousand channels that's uh, sufficient for yeah. now. Yeah. And can you can you choose the locations that you are measuring? Yes, you can do that. Uh, you kind of building a, a template of, of which brain area you want to investigate. Mm. And you then place your optodes in a specific pattern uh, designed for investigating in this area. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, you can pinpoint uh, a specific location if you want to do that. Yeah, yeah. And what do you think are the best one, best areas to look for the amputees? What what areas you are looking? Well, we have mostly been looking at prefrontal activity mm. because this is where decision making is uh, happening. Yeah, and uh, when you are challenging uh, this patient population with uh, different walking uh, challenges. We, our hypothesis has been that uh, the attention uh, for an, uh, decision making is increasing. So, mm. so we have to investigate the prefrontal area. And also, there are some technical difficulties with, for example, accessing mm. the area uh, of the brain that controls uh, the lower leg. Yeah. They, because they, li- they, they lie a little bit into. Uh, sulcus in the brain which you call which is on, on the top of your head yeah so it, it lays a little bit folded in uh, in this sulcus so so it may be more difficult to get readings good readings from that area yeah but for example <coughs> we haven't done studies on that but this fners would be very suitable for example doing studies on uh, upper limb back activities because the Brain area that, that represents the arm is uh, is located on uh, on the side of the head and is very easily accessible with uh, with this uh, technology. Yeah. So so we have been thinking of moving a little bit towards uh, upper arm studies. Yeah, and I think because our arms are more dexter, there's a bigger brain area yes, for, is, for that, so it's yeah. easier. Yeah. And is it difficult to actually find the area for the leg, or is it how difficult is it to measure the lower body? Uh, well, <clears throat> there are these technical difficulty I mentioned to you, mm. uh, and uh, but it all depends on on the kind of technology uh, which you use. So, 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 so if you have optodes that can penetrate a little bit deeper mm. than, than normal, you can access this area. Uh, and the the thing is that uh, there is one optode that is sending out light and another optode that is receiving the light mm. and the distance between this the sender and receiver is important for how deep you can scan into the brain tissue yeah, uh, yeah. you can <clears throat> if the distance between the sender and the receiver is three centimeters you can go about half that distance into the brain. Mm. So if you increase the distance between sender and optode, you can go deeper. 
but uh, then the scattering of light gets different uh, and uh, you face some other type of problems. Mm. So, yeah. so there are, uh, we are looking forward to some advancements in technology here to, to scan maybe a little bit deeper into the brain. Yeah, so how, how long have you been using this technology now? Mm, about five years, I think. Five years, all right. So I would assume there's quite a bit of learning curve that you have learned. So yeah. what are the practical tips, like very, very simple things that you have learned that you would like to share with other researchers? This is uh, something that cannot be learned by reading the manual. All right. Uh, <laughs> you uh, have to dig in and do some uh, <laughs> dirty work yeah, uh, and, and do experiments and but uh, with all new technology, there is a steep learning curve, but uh, it's it's not much more tricky than doing uh, other type of technical investigations. But one thing that maybe has been uh, a little bit of drawback during this five-year period is that there is no standardized way of how to analyze the data. Mm. Uh, so, when you look at different uh, publications, you see that everyone has their own way of, of, of doing filtering, pre-processing, statistical analysis, and so forth. So, uh, and this adds complexity to understand what is really going on mm. in the brain. So, there is a committee now looking at ways to standardize uh, this and, All right. and I think that would be very meaningful for, for this field uh, so, so that could give us some guidelines of what filters to use in what situations uh, and uh, what statistical methods are more appropriate for different uh, uh, designs, for example. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's the, the task force doing the recommendations now. Yes, it's yeah. uh, operative, yes. Yeah, yeah. Are you part of it? Or? No, I'm not. Uh, yeah, I'm just eager to <laughs> hear the results. <laughs> to hear the results. Yeah. yeah. So the data analysis is a little bit complicated. Do you have any any that what you have learned? Like, do you have anything to share about location or actually doing the measurements where you have? You know, it might help a lot of if you have made some mistake mm -hmm. and and it. You didn't get the data that somebody <laughs> else don't do the same mistake. Well, uh, I don't think we have done any major things that we have regretted. Uh, mm. But of, of course, uh, I think my main advice is to prepare and prepare and prepare and prepare. I do a lot pilot studies mm. so you get rid of all the small errors that could uh, affect your experiments <clears throat> and there's one maybe one topic uh, we haven't touched much into but uh, when you look at uh, what, what you're measuring in the brain is kind of the level of oxygenation mm. uh, and how much oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin there is in a specific uh, brain region. Mm. But this, of course, also will be affected by, for example, what is your heart rate, yeah. uh, which affects the cardiac output, uh, meaning how much blood is coming to the brain. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what is the blood pressure? Yeah. Uh, all these things are what we call confounding factors. Mm. Uh, which, in a way, occlude the real activity in the brain. Yeah. So there is a great attention now on how do we get rid of all these confounding factors. Yeah. And also, we don't we want to measure the pure brain activity, but we know that some of the signal is contaminated with activity from the scalp, for example. Yeah. There are blood vessels there also. Yeah. So. So, so these are learning points as you go. Uh, what may be confounding factors for this type of measurements? But, mm. but, but, but that is for any kind of measurement you do. What are the confounding factors that obscure your real uh, measurements? Yeah. 
but uh, for me, uh, <coughs> this FNIRS has been uh, quite a new experience. Uh, so the learning curve has been really, really steep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, <coughs> once you cross a certain threshold of understanding, it's uh, it's the same as doing other types of yeah. research. And, and are you doing the measurements in the lab or are you doing it also outside of the lab with this technology? We have done uh, most measurements in the lab, uh, but we are now also preparing for uh, using the equipment in uh, in our rehabilitation center mm. for, for looking at uh, how uh, lower limb amputees are coping during rehabilitation. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a kind of lab setting in that also, of course, but uh, uh, yeah, mostly lab and so forth. Mm, yeah, a lot of lot of new information for me <laughs> about this this technology. Yeah, we've been discussing quite a while. Is there something else you would like to discuss still? Well, uh, I think uh, I've been in research, uh, research quite a long time. And uh, I see now that uh, there are a lot of variables out there mm. uh, that makes the everyday life for a scientist much easier. Uh, yeah. Devices that are wireless, that are small, that are accurate. And they are, they are good because it, it could provide information that until now has been not so easily accessible. Yeah. Because uh, as, as for... The group I study most, uh, the lower limb amputees, we know very little about, uh, for example, their physical activity when they are at home. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they spend um, maybe many more hours in their home than uh, people with two intact legs do. Yeah. So we really need to know and understand uh, <coughs> the, their uh, levels of physical activity. And, yeah. And, uh, New devices uh, allow us to do that. Yeah. What What would be your dream wearable for the rehabilitation? Yeah, the, what What should it measure? What are the most important variables? Well, uh, I, I think there are different answers to this. One is uh, what's most valuable to the researcher, but mm. uh, also what's more valuable for the patient. Uh, and I think for a patient, it's it's a kind of system that gives you a, a green or red flag according to have you reached your target of physical activity, for example. Mm. Or have you sit, been sitting too much? Uh, have you been sedentary too much? Uh, yeah. You need to do this, you need to do that. Uh, things that could give this feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that would be important for for the this uh, patient group. Yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah, and from from the research point of view, what are the most important for the research in in the rehabilitation? I think uh, we need data that are more ecological valid, meaning that they represent more what the people do in their real life and uh, not uh, reflect what they do in the lab. Mm. Uh, I think that is really important. So we need to study more <clears throat> the type of activity people do when they are at home or at work or at school. Yeah, yeah, I see that. Yeah, it's been it's been very, very nice and interesting discussions of many, many different, different themes. Uh, Thanks a lot for being being a guest in today's episode. My pleasure. This podcast is sponsored by Fibian. Get scientific validation and learn more about Fibian at fibian.com slash research. The Physical Activity Researcher podcast has created an activity tracker purchase guide for researchers. Get your free copy from the link in the podcast description. Thank you for listening to the Physical Activity Researcher Podcast.